Hello everyone. In this next lecture, I'm going to go through an extended architecture design example and go through more detail than I went through earlier on with that Wikipedia example. Uh, first, let's review what we talked about last time. Last time the topic was authentication and um, the purpose of authentication is to uh, allow a service to handle requests uh, and in doing so treat those requests differently depending on, on who they're coming from. In other words, to allow a service to recognize who the request is coming from, to provide customized responses, and to protect private data. Uh, passwords are the most common way to do authentication. I think we've all experienced that. Uh, we also can use email or SMS as a side channel of communication. If you know the person's phone number, right, you can send a, a random number that you generate back to that person over SMS and then ask them to give it back to you. That um, as a way to prove that, that person has access to a certain phone number, right? A certain phone. That's a form of authentication, just uh, similar to a password. And in many of these authentication schemes, we use authentication tokens. These are strings that are randomly generated and stored on the back end for the purpose of verifying identity. Uh, in particular, uh, when you're logging in using a password, what you typically get back from the server is a session key which is kind of like a temporary password that was randomly generated by the server. The server saves that, so instead of in the future using your password every time you need to make a request, you use this temporary password, which is the session key. Cookies are the, the way that a browser implements session keys. Okay, so today I want to go through a case study that, that I'm very familiar with, which is the National Gun Violence Memorial, which is this nonprofit website that I um, founded. And um, the reason I'm using this as an example, although it's kind of a depressing example, so I apologize for that. Yeah, the reason I'm using it is because I have, um, I'm familiar with it and we have, I have a lot of data about um, the traffic level and, and the cost of operating and all that kind of stuff. So I'll be able to show you a lot of what's going on behind the scenes on a real website that is um, getting a significant amount of traffic. So uh, the architecture of this system, I guess at a software level, it's using Java servlets with the JSP. It's kind of like an old style of like of programming um, dynamic websites, but still still around and, and used by some people like me. Um, behind that, there's a SQL database. Um, it, it, it's actually a, a MySQL database, and it also uses S, uses S3 for storing images. So I'm going to talk in detail about all those things later, but just to give you a preview, um, this particular website is kind of uses a traditional design in the sense that the HTML is generated on the back end by the server and given most mostly complete to the uh, browser. The browser has a little bit of JavaScript to um, interact with pages, but for the most part, the UI is generated on the back end. So it's a traditional design. It's not a, a single page application design like you'd find um, with uh, React, for example. And the site is deployed to Amazon Web Services. So on AWS, uh, it's using uh, these six services. Elastic Beanstalk is the uh, application orchestration service, I guess. It runs uh, the Tomcat server that runs the Java code, basically. And it allows the, uh, multiple machines to run that Java code if necessary. I'm using EC2, which is Elastic Compute Cloud. They're, it's like the standard virtual machine service that's on AWS, kind of like the first uh, really popular uh, cloud computing service. And, uh, sorry, this should be RDS. RDS for Relational Database Service is um, Amazon's way to, to set up a, a, data, a relational database, but you can just think of it as a, a virtual machine that's running an open source uh, database software and CloudFront is a CDN that, that it uses and it's using uh, DNS is, is provided by the Route 53 service on AWS and finally there's an e email service that, that Amazon provides that I use to send emails th using an API. Okay, So we'll see how all these things are used in this uh, particular service. At a high level this is the architecture. Okay, so. We have, on the left-hand side, I have the user using a web browser, right? And that web browser can navigate to gunmemorial.org. I'm showing DNS here in a cloud to, to, to kind of indicate that the way the web browser is directed to, this, to the web application is by checking a DNS record to map from this host name 
to an IP address. That's just like the standard DNS thing. And of course, I have to configure DNS to give the correct IP address for this host name. Um, following that path along, what we see here, the main component that controls the application is this monolithic stateless web application. This is the one, that, like I mentioned, that's built in Java and using JSP. This connects to a few different other components, but the bulk of the application really is here. Okay, so. I'm showing in, in white the core components, and in blue are some third-party uh, components that are also used. So I'm going to move to the right here and show there's a, uh, a SQL database, a relational database, which in particular is, is MySQL. That's where most of the application state is stored, so the, the information about the data that's presented on the website is stored in this, this database. And on the bottom, another file store, another storage system apart from this relational database is an S3 file store. So S3 is Amazon's uh, bucket storage or object storage service. You kind of think of it like a, a, a big uh, file system, like a, a folder where you can store files. So the things you store here are files and you address them uh, with paths, like file names, like you would on your file stored on your computer, except it's in the cloud and it can grow to like an arbitrarily large size. And um, another interesting aspect of S3 is that it comes with the ability to, uh, it comes with a built-in web server provided by Amazon so that you can access those files through a web URL on the public. And you can configure it to be publicly accessible. So uh, for example, the images that are stored on the website, there are thousands of images, those are stored in S3 and S3 is configured to allow uh, any visitor through a browser, any browser, to, to if they use the correct URL, specifying the, the name of my bucket, which is, ends up being like a, the first element of the path here, after S3, um, they can, and if the correct file name is, is provided, um, it'll be able to access an, an, an image that's posted here publicly. So to modify the, to add new new, new images and to <clears throat> delete images, modify images, that's done using a REST API that has to be authenticated. So only, a, only you know my account can do that. <coughs> Only the, cre the credentials of my account are needed to make those modifications, but then th those files are also can be included in a website just by referring to an image, or I guess in general a file, with the correct uh, URL underneath S3. So that's a very convenient service for building websites. Okay, But there's, there's tabular data in this relational database. There are images down here, and those two things together primarily are what's used to render this website. Okay. Now notice that the browser is making two different kinds of requests. It'll the main requests it makes are to the gunnerworld.org domain. Those are mapped by DNS to connect to this web application, and what comes back is HTML. But some of the H, does it, HTML will contain uh, references to other items. In particular, the images that are on the page would have a URL that begins with s3.amazonaws.com/gunnerworld.media, and then those when the browser uh, needs to fetch those images, of course, uh, that'll map to a different IP address, which ends up being this public HTTP server connected to S3. Okay. The, if, moving further along to the right, there's another component. This other white box is the other like Java code that, that I've written. So this is the second most important piece of the system. This is a command line application uh, written in Java that um, scrapes data from another website and downloads it into my database. So this is uh, like kind of like an ETL tool you could think of it. Um, it accesses data so uh, gunlinesarchive.org is a sort of partner uh, organization in a way or in any case they're an organization that, that has data, that publishes data and has allowed um, us to copy their data. <laughs> okay, And that, that is a beginning point for creating uh, pages. So this, this code runs on a virtual machine and periodically, uh, I think three times a day, it checks for new data on gunviolencearchive.org on that public website and copies it down to this relational database. The other two components on the top that I haven't mentioned yet are uh, third-party services that the main web application connects to to do certain things. So for example, if a user through the web interface wants to make a donation to the system, to, to the, the, the organization. Uh, the web application interacts with Stripe or PayPal 
to process those donations. Okay, so there's like a REST API here. Um, or actually, there's a library that I'm using that probably behind this, under the covers uses a REST API, although I don't know. And then also, um, there is an SMTP server, which is to say an email server provided by Amazon. Um, and this uses the uh, SMTP protocol. When the, web, when the web application needs to send emails for certain things, like for password resets or um, and so on, uh, those emails are not sent directly by the application, but rather they're, con they're constructed by the Java Mail library and sent to this uh, mail server that then forwards them to the final destination. The purpose of doing that is to like uh, reduce um, the junk mail flagging that would otherwise happen if I was sending the mail directly from here. Okay, so those are the main components. There also is an, another uh, entry point to the system that's kind of optional but has been added for improved performance and that's a content delivery network, a CDN, to uh, distribute the images with lower latency and better performance to users around the world. So um, there's a different s a domain for this, uh, media.gumworld.org. That domain name through DNS maps to a different IP, uh, actually it maps to a C name, not to an IP address, but anyway, it maps to another uh, system, which is this content delivery network. M remember, content delivery networks are geographically distributed. HC caching HTTP reverse proxies. So basically it's a web server that has an origin server listed. In this case, the origin server is, is this S3 public HTTP server, the file server uh, for, for photos. Um, when a URL comes in, it either has a cached copy locally or it knows where to get the copy, which is from S3. And there are instances of this distributed all over, around the world. So if you're visiting a popular page, you'll um, be able to download a photo more quickly than having to go to the origin. There also is, we can, we, the system is complicated further by the fact that there's a kind of an, an another um, interface entirely. There's a subdomain talk.gunmemorial.org, which is a um, discussion forum. So it, it's like a community to where people like make posts and talk to each other and stuff like that. And that's not using the same software, so that like I didn't write any of the code for that. Instead, I used an open source forum application called Discourse, uh, and I just kind of like downloaded that and configured that to run on, a, on another another virtual machine that has has its own database and also has its own S3 uh, file bucket. So it's a, this S3 is the same S3 as this. In other words, these are both managed services from Amazon, but they're different uh, buckets, which is to say like different subfolders. See how this has a, a path name here that refers to the bucket. So this red stuff here is its own system that's all off the shelf software, it, you know, configured either with, with configuration files or with a, a graphical user interface on the website. Um, it has its own little um, three-tiered architecture. Okay, so in addition to that high-level diagrammatic view, we can think about um, the network-level API. Now, talking about an, an API for a monolithic web page is kind of weird because it's not a microservice architecture. The, the requests are all being made by a browser. Okay, so so the, what I'm going to show you here doesn't necessarily look like a REST API. Nevertheless, we can think about what are all the different pages being generated, and in some sense, that is a, an API. So it, I have two slides for this. The first are the public pages. So there are a bunch of different kinds of pages on the website. Um, as listed here, you can actually um, check out, the, the, there's a sitemap URL you can use here to see um, actually a list of all the different pages. And this is used by search engines to, uh, to index. So for example, there are all these pages that have different categories of uh, gun violence victims. There are different locations, different states. There are different cities within states that have their own de uh, dedicated pages. You know, so there are thousands of different pages. These are all dynamically generated. The content for these is all dynamically generated. They all have different URLs. Um, so this this page, uh, sitemap.txt, is, uh, is programmatically generated. And in addition to those pages, there also are um, are pages for the individual victims. So, for example, so 
you know, chronologically from this is this is looking at just the 2020 uh, victims so starting December 31st backwards. You just have different people, you know, their, their names listed as well as the date that they uh, were killed, and and each one of those is a web page that that we have. Okay. Right. So so most of those th those pages are either sorry, those pages are generated by Java code. It, it's either um, in some cases it's very simple JSP code that's almost like just hard coded HTML. Uh, in other cases, it's Java code that does a lot of dynamic generation uh, based on the, the data that's in the database, um, referring to images in S3 and all that kind of stuff. There's some HTML forms uh, on the pages that lead to some additional endpoints that don't, these don't correspond to pages, but rather these are more like uh, API endpoints that the JavaScript code running on the pages interacts with. So for example, basically there are certain actions you can take as a user on the page that don't involve navigating to a new page, but rather just involve things happening in the background with JavaScript. And for those, there are these post uh, endpoints. Okay. Now, this is these aren't using a REST style, so you'll notice that the names of the endpoints are, are verbs, like do, light, candle, and set a REST version of this might be like put, you know, victim slash the victim ID slash candle something like that or um, maybe post in that case because that's something that can be repeated to, to add additional candles uh, candle light actions uh, so yeah so the user can can light a candle on a page you notice that there's a you have to specify the victim ID there and numerically post a photo that includes um, both the image data as well as information that's provided by the user about the photos so like metadata and there you can post comments those are called question answers in the system and then finally there's like uh, an interaction with the donation part of the system which is it done by the JavaScript in the stripe library that runs on the client actually so it's kind of complicated um, yeah so apart from that public side of the page there's also a volunteers portal which has actually a lot more forms and things you can do because uh, there are volunteers that use the site basically to, cr to create and edit different pages. So it's kind of like a, um, a, c a CRM, uh, uh, CMS, not CRM, a, a content management system. Uh, so these requests are different because they're all authenticated. So you have to have a, c a cookie set to... Um, identify who you are. The only one that doesn't have it require a cookie is the sign-in request. When you make that request, what you get back is, is a cookie, and in, in these these other requests require you to have a cookie set. So they're, basically there are different pages that allow you to do different things on the page. Now, since you don't know the page very well, like that's not terribly interesting. Just notice that some of them take parameters, like if you're editing a particular victim's page, the URL for it takes as a query parameter the numeric ID of the, of the victim. So if you change the number, you get a, a, the editor page for a different victim. And, you know, photo editor, same thing. And then also there are forms on those pages, HTML forms that provide data and have buttons to click to, to enter that data. And those also have actions that to have end, post endpoints to handle those actions. So if I were to document the API for this uh, page, I would I would kind of show these two things here. Now, uh, as I said, these are not it's not a RESTful API because it's being accessed through HTML forms, and the way forms work, just like the basic 1992 style of forms or whatever it is, um, you by default you use it when you click you have a button that you click that does a post to a certain URL, and it can provide query parameters based on the HTML input elements that are in the form, so things like text fields and selectors and drop downs and things like that. So uh, when you click, you kind of trigger the this action to happen. So we could change this to be a restful restful style, but then the code on the client side would ha would have to do something more complex than just basic HTML forms. So this particular last one, as an example, if we want to delete a page for a victim. Instead of doing post slash admin slash do delete victim, how would you redesign this to follow REST design principles? Actually, I want you to stop and think about that for a second, if you can remember 
Rust design principles? Well, the answer I have is to use the, the delete method and uh, specify as the path uh, slash victim slash ID. So with a RESTful design, the, the HTTP verb specifies the action you're taking, taking, and it's either get, post, put, or delete. And the path specifies the, the data object that you're modifying. So where I've noticed that contrary to that, in my, in my design, the path specifies the verb of like the thing that's happening rather than the and the uh, post you know the HTTP verb is kind of meaningless okay all right so the next important thing to talk about when, when discussing the architecture of the system I think is the database uh, schema okay so this is a little bit simplified but for this system um, these this is roughly what the schema is so there's some ellipses where there's there's there are missing columns but remember each of these boxes refers to a table and the table name is is in uh, is at the top in black and these other things are columns so every row in this table has a value for each of these columns now the main table here that everything kind of revolves around you can tell by these arrows is the victim table so that in this ter terminology of the of this system victim means a you know a person who is uh, lost to gun violence and therefore that we have a page for on the on the system right so this kind of corresponds to page or person uh, this victim uh, table so we, we have certain information about that person like their name uh, uh, where they were killed and, and when and, and so on you know age and so forth and then there's peripheral information about them that refers back so whenever you see arrows remember that that refers that's a foreign key where you have a, a child table referring to a, a parent table so every comment, for example, has um, you know has some text comment, but it also refers to a particular victim. So that's why this is a child table of this. You have to have a victim first before you can have a comment on that victim. Okay, you have to have a victim first before you have a photo, for because every photo is associated with a victim. That's what this um, uh, arrow foreign key indicates. So, yeah, I'm not going to go through this in a, in a ton of detail, but um, just to, to point out one of the more like complex modeling relationships here. So every page has certain information that, that is shown in, in that is, is recorded in the row for that page for that victim. There also can be multiple photos. So this creates a many to one relationship. Notice that the primary key here is photo ID that can be different for each uh, for several photos of the same victim. So this victim uh, column can be repeated many times along many photos for one person. There can only be one, we want to select one of those to be the primary photo though. <clears throat> and the way that's done is with a subset table here. So this primary photo table just has um, two columns here in the simplest uh, design. It, it, it lists for each for a victim, what is the photo that is the primary photo? There doesn't have to be, notice that there doesn't have to be a primary photo for each victim, and that's why this is in a, this is in a separate table. If we wanted every victim to have a photo, then um, you could have a, a column here that said primary photo, and that would point to a photo. Instead, because it's optional, we have this uh, subset table. We have a foreign key here that's also uh, a primary key, and so that means that the number of rows here, we can have at most one primary photo row for every victim. We cannot have more than one because the pri this victim value cannot repeat among multiple rows. Okay. Notice also hanging out here, there's this, this, this table that doesn't point to anything, global property. This is just a catch-all key value store for various things the database wants to track globally, but it doesn't really fit into a larger schema. So, for example, the uh, I think the maybe the, the date when the scraper was last run might be stored there, and the the, the total amount of donation made so far in, in the past year is stored here, and um, various other things are just like there's like about five or six variables that need to be stored globally that aren't so they aren't things that are repeated; they're just kind of like individual one-off um, values. So in addition to that database, the other kind of persistent storage is S3. So, oh, whoops. Remember, S3 
as I mentioned, is a uh, it's a it's a scalable managed uh, file system. There, it, it's also called an object store. Something similar to this. S3 is the specific Amazon product, but there's something just like this provided by um, all the other cloud services. It's a very very useful service, and it just stores files for you. And and each file has a path, just like on your computer. Every file has a path. So some sub a, a series of folders and a file. It's not. It's different than your own file system because these folders aren't really like meaningful in in the way to the way that the the data is stored. These really just correspond to long file names. It's kind of like a big key for that data, and the content of the data, just like any other file, is a big array of bytes. Okay. And so I'm specifying here all the different types of files that are stored in S3, all the different patterns, different categories that may have different like like uh, URLs. So the second one here. I show here just like the photo, the, the photos themselves are under photo slash, then photo number, and then dot JPEG because they're all JPEGs. Um, there are candidate photos here, which are photos that have been posted but not yet approved. These also are in a different folder, but they have a uh, they have an ID dot JPEG as well for their storage. Except these IDs are different because they're not auto incrementing. They're not like integers that just go up from one like the photos are. Instead, they are uh, randomly generated. They're, they're UUIDs. So um, although the web server does provide these to anyone who asks without authentication, you would have to kind of guess a long random number to see one of these candidate photos that hasn't yet been approved to be shown on the site yet. And similar, and, and also, you know, every photo has, has different sized versions of it because in different contexts on the website, you um, might, this photo might appear small or large, and providing a link to a reference to a small version of the photo will allow it to download faster, as opposed to using the big. I mean, technically, the browser can take a big photo and scale it down to a small size, but that means that the browser has to download the big photo first before scaling it. So that's why we have um, actually four different sizes for each photo: the original, 100 pixel tall, 400 tall, and 800 wide version of the images. And finally, we have copies of HTML articles that we link to uh, in case those news articles get uh, removed. All right, so this, this S3 bucket is uh, is in a Amazon data center in Virginia. Uh, so it's US East 1 region, uh, which is okay. But we use a CDN to provide copies of the most recently accessed photos in uh, locations all around the country in particular, and also around the world, but most importantly around the country because that's where the, most of the traffic comes from. It's mostly US traffic. Um, so if you're visiting the homepage from California, let's say, you don't have to download the images from Virginia. You would be downloading those from uh, the CDN node nearby because you know the homepage is a page that's being visited a lot, so all those images are going to be cached uh, in the CDN. And using that CDN, of course, is, is very easy. Um, it's just with a few clicks that you can set that up. That's that's pretty cool. All right, so looking at this particular service, um, this is a site that's like, I don't know how you would describe it. It's like small to medium sized, I guess. The number of visitors per day is, in this example, is like in this month is about 25,000 users per day. A um, number of unique page views is uh, 5 million over the month. So I guess in a given, in a given day, they're like 140. 50,000 um, page views. And the more page views we have, the more we're going to have to pay to uh, run the site, right? Because all these services cost money. So that in April 2020, I did an analysis to figure out the costs in a given month. And that the operating cost for that month was $136. So um, I don't know if that sounds expensive or not to you, but it's, it's pretty cheap considering that the, the amount of traffic it gets and the kind of the importance of the site. Um, so uh, so the website's being operated in a pretty efficient way with pretty low cost. The way the costs break down are as follows in this in this pie chart. So the biggest chunk is actually for the CDN, and that's an optional thing. So if I was willing to allow the performance to be a little slower, you could remove this and reduce the cost uh, by that amount. Uh, there's a certain amount paid for the database here, shown in, in red, $28 a month. Data transfer, this is like the charge that, that Amazon... Uh, gives just to 
they actually measure all the data that flows in and out of your virtual machines and your CDN and, and database and everything else and, and bill you per, per gigabyte. So if there's more traffic, this would go up. And then running the virtual machines costs a certain amount just for two virtual machines, six, or, or three, I guess, $16. It's not really that much. Storing the files in that distributed file system, like per gigabyte, you pay a certain amount. And so that storage is costing $9. And finally, DNS costs $1.30. There's another tiny sliver for the email service, which is just like pennies. Uh, yep. Okay, by the way, this um, the plots I'm showing you on the right-hand side of the screen, like this data about how much traffic is on the site, this is uh, available to me from Google Analytics. Google Analytics is a kind of like plugin that you can add to your website. And pretty much every website has some kind of analytics tool built in. And what that does is when the visitor visits your website, there's some JavaScript code that causes the browser of that visitor to send information to that analytics uh, platform. So for example, when a user visits the National Gun Violence Memorial, um, their browser will, in addition to doing the normal things to load the page, when it loads the page, it'll see some JavaScript code that asks it to make a request to Google telling it what page it has just visited. And then Google records that and then makes this dashboard available uh, to me as the website operator. Okay. And also collects data for their own purposes for like customizing ads and all kinds of stuff. But that's what you get for using a free service, I guess. If you use a, um, a, 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 a a, ta a blocker, um, what's the term for it? Um, a tag blocker like Ghostery, like a, a browser plugin that, that, that blocks uh, third party uh, cookies and, and, and tags and stuff, then you would not actually be sending that data to Google. And so when, like, when I personally visit the, the website, it doesn't record, Google doesn't record that traffic because I'm using the Ghostery plugin to block that, um, that, that interaction with a third party service. All right, so the other data I have to show is related to the content delivery network, the CDN. So in the same month, um, you can, this is just, this just comes from Amazon's uh, dashboard for, in my account for this, this web page. And, uh, you know, you see there are about a million requests per uh, day that are made to the content delivery network. Of those, a certain fraction are cache hits and a certain fraction are cache misses. And they actually tell you um, how much is in each category. So you can see the blue line here are the uh, misses and the green is a total traffic. So about half of the traffic on the CDN are cache misses and half are cache hits, which is not great for CDN. If you're if, like, I'm not getting a lot of benefit from the CDN. Uh, you know, it'd be nice to have like, let's say 90% of the traffic handled by the CDN. About half of the requests go to the CDN and the CDN has to turn around and make a request to the origin server to get the data. Um, the reason for that is because there's, it's kind of a long tail system. There are uh, tens of thousands of different pages that people visit. It's not just like one. There is a home page, but the home page is not the most popular thing for people to visit. So it's not the same data people tend to be visiting. I mean, a certain amount of it is the same, and that's what shows up in the um, content delivery network uh, hit statistics. But um, yeah, it's also a long tail. All right, so if we take that cost and translate it to the to the architecture diagram, we can uh, I can do some of the assignments here. So, for example, the main application in the middle, this kind of like the runs the, the bulk of the code that was uh, that took a lot of time to write, that costs four dollars a month to run. So actually, this is mi pretty minuscule. Part of the reason is because it's stateless um, and written in Java, like it doesn't require a lot of CPU uh, to do its work, and it doesn't have any like. Uh, it only has a little bit of uh, disk storage, nine gigabytes, so that's cheap. Um, one of the biggest costs is for the database. Remember, the database is like kind of like the everything relies on this on the database. It's kind of at the center of everything, and so that that can be a performance bottleneck. Uh, this costs twenty nine dollars for a t three dot small instance with a hundred gigabytes of storage. Now, interestingly, I don't need anywhere near to a hundred gigabytes of capacity to store the data itself. But the way Amazon provisions its uh, per, like the performance of, of its storage is that they give you a certain amount of IOs per second per gigabyte of storage that you have because like they have a, they have physical disks um, and those disks are limited in both capacity and IO bandwidth and, and they provision them together. So if you if you pay for a full disk, you get both all the capacity and all the IO bandwidth even if you only need let's say the IO bandwidth, right? 
so it makes sense for them to, to provision to to charge for them together because when they deploy them they have to pay for them together anyway so that that's twenty nine dollars a month there's another virtual machine up here for the over here for the web scraper this is a t2.nano with eight gigabytes of storage it's just like the smallest possible machine with half a gigabyte of memory this only costs two dollars and fifty cents a month to run and then on this left hand side there is one other virtual machine to run this forum the forum doesn't get nearly as much traffic as the main application so it's uh, it's pretty small this t2.micro includes both the application as well as a dedicated database um, uh, for it yeah okay yeah so one of the things that that you can do to reduce the cost of some of these things like the virtual machines is to reserve them for a year I think you get something like 30 or 40 percent savings. I mean, normally you can spin up a virtual machine and use it just for as long as you want, and your build like by the f you're building a pretty small fine granularity. I forget exactly what it is, but it's it's like by the quarter of an hour or, or, or something like that. It depends on the cloud provider. So you can use a machine for like just two hours and only pay for two hours, right? It takes a few minutes to start and stop, so it's not like really instantaneous. We'll talk later on about other kinds of compute platforms. Um, serverless functions and uh, containers are two, two examples. Those are much easier to, much quicker to spin up and spin down. So th those work well for like really um, short term, short term uh, computation. This thing here, like all of these that I'm showing, these are virtual machines that I'm going to use not just for a short amount of time, but for years. And if I know ahead of time what the capacity I need, I'm not going to try to. I'm not going to need to vertically scale them, like to go from a micro to a small to a medium to a large. If I'm going to stay the same size, and you can reserve it ahead of time for a, for a year or three years and save money that way. Um, the reason why they charge you, why the cloud char provider charges you less, is because it means that they can predict how much capacity they need. They know that they're not they're not buying machines that are not going to be used later. They're going to continue. They know that they can count on getting revenue from that resource uh, in the future. All right, so I want to go through an exercise here, which I think is, 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 is helpful. Now that we've set up the basics, now notice what, what I've showed you so far is not super new or surprising. I mean, there were, there were more third-party integrations than we saw in the past. Um, there was this S3 file store, uh, which is a little bit new. But for the most part, this is really pretty sim similar to like the Wikipedia architecture. But what's more interesting now is thinking about what to do, uh, what we would have to do to take this application and scale it up to more traffic. So the the math I did was okay, the, the most traffic this website could possibly get would be would be would, would be, you know, to, to go from being just a, a kind of niche news source and, and source of uh, information online to be the most popular source of, of news online. Like let's say CNN.com. I'm not sure it's the most popular, but it's one of the most popular ones. The amount of traffic on CNN.com by my calculation is about 200 times the amount of traffic on this system. Okay, so what do we, what do we have to do to handle 200 times as much traffic? Now, I want you to stop and think about the changes you could make here to get the system to handle 200 times as much traffic. Uh, and this it's a complex question, so feel free to stop for a few minutes to think about all the different parts of it. Okay, I hope you went through that exercise. I'm going to go through a few different things uh, you can do to scale here. Now, the first one, first place you have to look really is the database. Now previously I had a single um, machine for a for the database. We need to scale it both vertically and horizontally if we're going to handle more traffic. Now remember vertically just means giving it a bigger virtual machine. We can go from that t3.small all the way up to an r5d24xl. <laughs> okay, um, That's the biggest. 24xl. It's funny because like when when the when the uh, when EC2 was first like uh, developed in the early days, I think they probably just had like you know small, medium, large. But then over time, CPUs have 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 developed more and more CPU cores. So now that you can get get like 96 cores in one chip, that was definitely not true before. So they had to come up with new names like 24 extra large. Uh, to, to describe the, the really huge machines. Anyway, so you can scale vertically, and what you can do is take the database. Uh, if you're using the same, you know, we're going to assume we're going to use the exact same database software, so let's say MySQL, um, and run that on a much bigger machine with, let's say, like 96 cores or whatever number of cores this has. In addition to that, we can create read replicas. 
because this is an application where most of the traffic is reads. There are some writes, and there's a decent amount of writes, but but um, there also is a, a lot of read traffic. I'm not sure how many read replicas you'd need, but let's just assume that we're going to have some. We're going to set up some kind of load balancing library in the application to access those. And actually, I showed you a couple uh, lectures ago, literally the load balancing library that already is implemented in this application to, do, to handle read replicas, because this is a scaling thing that I've done before uh, for this application. Okay, so that's the first thing. Scale up, up in the database and um, add read replicas. Notice that this is not a software change. The only software change was this little load balancing library in the web application, but uh, mostly this was an operational change which is pretty interesting. The schema is exactly the same. We don't have to like do, we're not really making software changes. We're just making operational changes. Secondly, you might have thought of this. Um, we can stick a load balancer in front of this thing and have multiple clones of this stateless monolithic web application. Okay, so uh, that's pretty straightforward. This load balancer could be an HTTP reverse proxy or it could be like a, a a packet level load balancer doesn't matter. Okay. We can also do more caching. So in addition to this uh, CDN in front of the images, we can add a CDN in front of the application as well. So notice, so remember well, the purpose of this web application is to generate uh, HTML pages. Like it renders the UI basically. So every page, like if you visit a particular victim's page, you'll see you know, their name, city, you'll see photos of them, you'll see comments that people left. All that stuff is, is, is um, constructed based on data that's in the database you know, and it referring to photos that are in here in, in S3. But if a lot of people are visiting the same pages, then caching would help. You don't want to have to regenerate the same page over, over, over and over again, just like with Wikipedia, regenerating the same article uh, HTML pages. So you can have that CDN work in front of the main application as well as being in front of the uh, image uh, file bucket. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's what we have in the final design. Just made three changes. Scaled up the database, horizontally scaled the application with a load balancer, and uh, put a content delivery network in front of the application. Not a ton of changes, so that basic three-tiered architecture is you architectures would normally be scaled in that way now you know later on in the course don't get me wrong we're going to talk about things that are more complicated than that but we're starting with a basic architecture design and we're doing a basic scaling exercise okay but i'm going to show here in the next few slides that actually we can get pretty far in doing this and i promised you that uh what we we're going to do is scale this thing up to the same level as cnn.com so we're going to do some math now to figure out whether whether the design we just mentioned is actually scalable enough like we still have that just that one we still have that one um, primary uh, SQL database that's handling all the rights. Is that big enough? Can we have just one machine handle all those rights? So to answer that question, I'm, let's look at the statistics, the amount of traffic. Um, so these are the events. Again, this is actually again reported by uh, Google Analytics. In this month of, of, of April, there were about um, 400,000 different events from users that would lead to a database write. And these are typically things like uh, the most popular one is lighting a candle. So that basically increments a counter, but it also makes a record of it because we, we have rules to like um, the way candles work is that you can light one per day and uh, rather than just like sitting there and clicking all the time. So it's kind of like a, a ritual thing. And um, yeah, so there's a bunch of information that it's not just a number that's updated when you write, but anyway, you create a row in a database when you light a candle. Similarly, you can um, you can add comments, photos, you can you can moderate, you can like comments and stuff like that. That's what those other things are. But anyway, those actions total about 40, 400,000 a month. We're going to scale up to 200, 200 times the load, so we're going to take that and scale it up to, by 200. So that means we have to handle 880 million um, writes per month to the database. If you stop and think, 80 million, of course, is a big number, but a month is a long time. So if we divide that, um, if we divide that by the number of seconds in a month, or 2.6 million seconds in a month, apparently, that means that in this big system we're going to have 30 database writes per second, um, roughly. 30 per second does not seem like a lot for a computer. Okay. 
Now, I think this is a little bit, this is the back of the envelope calculation, and in reality, implementing one of these things, some of these things would involve multiple writes. But 30 is like, give us a, is pretty small, it gives us a lot of cushion. This is definitely achievable. So we, we know that a magnetic disk can do 100 oper operations per second, I.O. operations. Um, a solid state disk can do about 5,000 I.O. operations per second. So, if, so we're talking about doing 30 things per second. Now, of course, there's going to be amplification between the number. These, these high-level actions get translated into more than one database operation, and each database operation gets translated into more than one disk operation. So I'm not sure exactly. You would really want to measure um, the, the hardware performance at this level before uh, and then scale that up. But anyway, this, this back-of-the-envelope exercise shows that there's plenty of capacity, uh, even with a single disk. Even with a single, uh, you might need a, a probably need an SSD, a single SSD rather than a single magnetic disk. But still, that's that's really not a, a difficult design or expensive design to achieve. Okay. So again, this is a theoretical exercise. Let's try to look at um, let's try to look at an empirical analysis. So, looking at the actual traffic, so that the cloud um, dashboard gives some nice tools to monitor the hardware activity. Okay, so in particular you can see the on the on the database instance currently on this t3.small database you can see how many write IOs per second there are and how many read IOs per second there are. Now actually on this database there are with um, the traffic as it is there are about 10 read and write IOs per second. Now of course now you so we can take that empirical number and scale that up by 200 which means that we uh, would get 2,000 IOs per second. Now notice that, that number 2,000 is a lot bigger than the 30 that I estimated uh, as a lower bound. Okay, so that's, so that's where looking at it. empirical data is, is quite important in, in doing scaling analysis. So this is a demonstration of that. Um, and also we might find this, this itself, scaling up empirical data is, is kind of theoretical in a sense. So what you'd really want to do is, is maybe practice scaling it up and generate some synthetic load to try to mimic the real environment and see if, see if the system still works. But anyway, we can take the, these statistics and multiply them by 200 times. So we're going to split this into two different categories, but I want you to stop and think actually now. Uh, see if you can an try to answer the question of whether a single machine can handle 200 times the load given that we are seeing this right now with with you know one times the load. Now notice you have to keep in mind that the CPU utilization is for a machine with two CPU cores. You can assume that we can go up to 96 CPU cores. And um, I guess for these I for the other assumption you can make is that Amazon allows your database instance to have storage of up, with up to 32 IOs per second. And they would achieve that by having by using RAID. So I noticed, noticed I told you before the single solid state drive can get like 5,000 IOs per second. Of course, you can use them in parallel. That's what RAID does, and that's how Amazon is able to give you access to storage that's much faster. Okay, yeah. So using those numbers, can you can uh, can we get to 200 times the level and stay below these? What do you think? Please try that. Do the math. Well, the answer is yes. Um, yes for the IOs, right? 200 times uh, 10 is 2,000 IOs per second. That's much less than the 32,000 that we can pay, we can buy from Amazon. Also, for the CPUs, we can handle that as well because the the biggest instance has 96 CPU cores. Um, notice that with two CPU cores, we're only using on average like we're, we're under three percent utilization. So we can kind of go up 30 times on this machine before we even have to scale it, and that's just with two CPU cores. So, I mean, the math here um, is that if we have 48 times as many C CPU cores, because we're going from 2 to 96 times 30 times the load, we can handle rough, these CPUs can handle roughly 14,000 times the load, whereas our, our goal is just to get to 200 times. So that's much greater. Now, keep in mind, you don't actually want to run a system that is going at 100% CPU utilization. Um, but you know, maybe like 30, 40% should be uh, okay. And, and that would allow us to get up to like 700 times the uh, current load. So it seems like we can actually get there with this, with this design. Now, of course, what would, 
CNN itself, I'm sure, is designed in a way that it's a much more complex application. So I think probably if you were to look at the amount of load and the cost of running CNN.com on um, uh, on 25,000 visitors per month, their cost would be higher. So I think I'm sure that CNN.com doesn't have an architecture as simple as this because their application probably is more, I don't want to say bloated, but it's more complicated and therefore is less efficient because it's doing more. So we saw that the National Gun Violence Memorial website is easy to scale. Like it didn't, co it didn't. We could design a simple sy system, um, monolithic application, relational database, off-the-shelf CDN, off-the-shelf file store. Those are all things that are easy to use. So why is this application in particular easy to scale compared to some other ones? This is kind of a deep question. So I would encourage you to stop and think about this now. Well, there, there are a few reasons. Um, first of all, the traffic is mostly reads. Why is that beneficial? Well, just like Wikipedia, um, if, if most of your traffic is reads, you can do a lot of caching. So you can use CDNs to take off a lot of the load. I guess another thing that we didn't mention, the previous exercise, that CNN.com thing, if we're, if we're getting 200 times the traffic, the amount of load is, on our origin server is not going to be 200 times as great because the caches are going to be able to be more effective. There are going to be more cache hits as a system scales because fewer pages are going to be like lonely pages that no one, that only one person visits. Um, there's going to be more repeat traffic. Okay, so other reasons why that this is easy to scale. The visitors to the page are not logged in, so they're not getting customized content, personal recommendations. There are no user behavioral models. It's, this is like different than, let's say, Facebook. Uh, it's just a, a, a set of articles that are like all consistent. Each user gets the same HTML regardless of who they are, where they're coming from. Um, and that allows the responses to be cached in a CDN and reused. Okay. Also, when there are edits to the data, like when, when someone lights a candle or leaves a comment, those things are not super critical. They can be, they, they, those can be delayed before other people see them. So caching a page is still possible even though pages can change. Like the number of candles can go up from, let's say, 125 to 126. If, if other people don't see that until 10 minutes later that the, that the number of candles has gone up, that's not a big deal. The users don't interact with directly with each other, so there's no need for, for like push notifications or things like that. So it's just like a, a um, kind of like uh, article delivery or content delivery uh, system one way. The pages are independent of each other. Um, and so when a change happens on one, it could be, it doesn't have to, like you if you needed to scale more, you could, um, for example, you could shard the system by victim ID, like a hash of the victim ID. Because notice, remember in the, in the database diagram, all that most of the data is like can be associated with one victim. Like the, there's a set of individual pages; those pages are independent. If we needed to scale to, to scale more, we could shard it very easily. And that might have been a suggestion that you had when I asked you to stop and think. You could also shard by state, you know, geographically, things like that. Um, also, another peculiarity here is that the data size doesn't scale with the traffic. This is similar to a newspaper as well, to a news site. Um, you know, we have a certain number of memorial pages that is like we get 30 new ones every day, roughly 30, 35. Um, no matter how popular the website is, that number is going to stay the same because, uh, you know, it's tied to the number of gun violence victims in the U.S. and it's not tied to the amount of traffic. Another similar page like legacy.com is, is the, I think the, probably the most popular online website for uh, for memorials, like for obituaries uh, that the people create, like funeral homes create them and people create them themselves. This is a much more difficult application to scale. I think, incidentally, I think they're, they're based in Evanston, or they were. Um, this is a much more difficult application to scale because as more users join your system, um, they are, they're joining your system because they're adding new pages, right? So it's much more of a long tail uh, kind of a system. Also, um, the rights just happen to not involve any transactions. There's no like, um, you know, bank balances and like things like that where two things need to happen at once. All right. So to recap, today I showed uh, the National Gun Violence Memorial software architecture uh, as a case study. And in particular, uh, because I have um, experience and data with about what's going on behind the scenes, I was able to give you a little bit of a sense of what happens operationally with running, running a website and how... Um, costs change when you scale and um, 
how a simple design can scale to be quite large if the requirements of the system are such that it's amenable to scaling, to easy scaling. I mean, there, most any system can scale if you're clever enough, I guess. Maybe, maybe that's a bad thing to say. Uh, but this particular system, you know, a, a article publishing system with a minimal amount of user uh, interaction that's that's uh, siloed to the pages, that's an easy kind of system to uh, to scale. It's actually the, the architecture overall is very similar to Wikipedia because you could think of it as another kind, as a an article publishing system. There's, there's caching and load balancers on the front end. There's a stateless application on the back end. There's a SQL database with the read replicas. There's also a, a file store for the large media files photos. If you actually read through that, that's literally the same thing as Wikipedia. But that's a system. That's an architecture you should be familiar with because it's the most common kind, and most of the more complex architectures are kind of variations of that. But we'll see, you know, in the, in the coming weeks, how uh, things, what other options are available to um, handle more sophisticated applications. All right, thank you. See you later.